setup here, I'll be talking a little bit about wild animal ethics. Um, in particular, I'll be talking about one key problem in, in wild animal ethics, which is the problem of wild animal suffering. And I, I know you've already had a kind of content warning before, but some of the causes of wild animal suffering are not very uh, pretty. I haven't gone into any graphic detail or I don't have any videos or anything like that, but some of this stuff is, you know, potentially upsetting. So I just wanted to let you guys know that um, in advance. Um, okay, so uh, can we move to the second slide, please? Yep, yeah, try. There we go. Brilliant. Okay. So before we talk about wild animal ethics, I guess I should say a little something about animal ethics. So animal ethics is an area of practical ethics which investigates how we should interact with non-human animals. And there's a couple of key terms that are going to be useful for us in this conversation. Um, so animal ethicists have um, sort of argued and uh, argued for the fact that non-human animals are sentient, which means that they have uh, the capacity to experience the world subjectively, to feel pleasure and pain, um, to feel you know good and bad subjective states. They've also argued that being sentient is a, is a sufficient condition for having moral standing. What moral standing means in simple terms is that um, if a being has moral standing, we ought to take their interests into account whenever we decide what we're going to do. If we act in some way that might affect that being, we need to take that being into account, um, which might sound slightly complicated with the technical terms, but it's really simple. You know, we understand this intuitively. We, we don't see anything wrong about kicking a stone into the sea or anything like that because the stone doesn't have any feelings. We can't do anything to make the stone's life, life, <laughs> the stone's existence go better or worse. Whereas if we were to kick an animal like a cat, for example, it's going to cause the animal pain and distress. Um, so uh, the cat is sentient. She has some interests that we ought to take seriously when we decide how to treat her. Uh, so that's all moral standing means. Um, next slide, please. So until, until pretty recently, animal ethicists have focused pretty much exclusively on domesticated animals. Um, and that's for good reason. Uh, we, our treatment as a species of non-human animals under our control has been and is pretty bad. Um, we inflict a lot of pain and suffering on billions of animals every year for pretty trivial reasons. So, you know, it, it makes sense that animal ethicists have focused on, on this issue. In recent years, though, in maybe the last 20 years or so, there's been a, a sort of growing realization, a recognition of the fact that wild animals um, are also sentient beings with moral standing. It's also important how their lives go. It's important that their lives go well rather than going badly. So this has sort of launched the field of wild animal ethics, which investigates pretty much how we should treat non-human animals who aren't under our control, non-human animals who live in the wild, for example. Um, so one of the, or maybe the central problem for wild animal ethics is the problem of wild animal suffering. So it seems to be the case that animals in the wild suffer from an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of causes, a lot, there's an awful lot of harms in the natural world that cause pain and suffering and, and premature death to wild animals. Um, and if, if we care about the well-being of domesticated animals, it makes sense that we should also care about the well-being of wild animals. You know, if we want life to go better for animals, it shouldn't really matter whether they're wild or domesticated. They still have a, a welfare. They still have lives that can go well or badly for them. Um, next slide, please, Liz. Um, and in fact, the problem of wild animal suffering at least in, in terms of numbers, it seems like it might be an even bigger problem than the problem of um, how we treat domesticated animals. So it's very hard to get um, totally accurate estimates of the numbers of wild animals, but I, I've taken the very lowest, most conservative estimates and focusing solely on vertebrates. So that's animals with a spine. So, you know, mammals, birds, fish, reptiles. There are at the very least 10 trillion wild animals in the world today, uh, at any one moment, I mean. Whereas, you know, there are 8 billion humans and about 24 billion farmed animals. So if we're going to take the problem of wild animal suffering and animal well-being seriously, um, the sheer numbers of wild animals who, who endure suffering in nature sort of makes this a, a really important issue. Um, 
Next slide, please. Um, and just one sort of misconception that I, I want to clear up before anyone raises it in the questions. Um, you've probably all seen infographics like this, which is usually talking about biodiversity loss or, um, or environmental, environmentalist stuff. Um, so these kinds of slides, uh, which say, you know, most animals are domesticated animals or humans, these are actually talking about biomass. So this isn't talking about individual animals. Uh, this is talking about how, how much, <laughs> yeah, the total biomass of the planet. So how heavy the animals are. So it is true that 60% of mammal biomass is livestock. Um, this is because animals we raise for food are typically pretty big and heavy. A cow weighs you know, three or 400 kilograms. A human is 60 or 70 kilograms. Uh, whereas a mouse, for example, or, or a small wild fish might weigh about 20 grams. So while these sorts of graphs are, are pointing out something true, it's kind of irrelevant to our purposes here. Um, most actual individual animals are wild animals, even if by weight, most animals are domesticated animals. So I just wanted to clear that up first. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so before I, I go on to talk about the issues of wild animal suffering, I want to say one or two things about what, what wild animal ethics isn't. So first off, it isn't the same as environmentalism or conservationism. Um, obviously there's some overlap here between the concerns of environmentalists and the concerns of wild animal ethicists, but there's a, a very different focus, uh, different, there's differences in principle and differences in practice. So primarily, environmentalists are interested in the preservation of ecosystems and species. So they're concerned with kind of ab more abstract, holistic uh, entities, you know. So an environmentalist might be very concerned that we keep particular species in existence, but they're less concerned about what happens to individual animals. So for an environmentalist, it doesn't really matter so much if a lot of animals suffer and die, so long as the species continues. Um, so this might sound like something that's, you know, just a, a theoretical difference, but it actually has huge implications in practice because animal ethicists, ethicists, it's a hard word to say, are um, concerned with animals as individual beings who have moral standing themselves. So um, one, one, one instance in which this makes a practical difference is um, in the practice of culling, for example, culling invasive species. So an environmentalist might think it's very important to preserve or protect some native species by killing off uh, members of so-called invasive species. So in the UK, for example, we have been killing off gray squirrels for about 100 years now, um, purely because we want to protect the native red squirrel. So it's not, an, it's not a concern for the well-being of any particular animal. It's a, it's a concern that the ecosystem and the biosphere looks a certain way. It has certain ecosystems. It has certain species in it. Um, so it's not a concern for individual animals. Um, <clears throat> secondly, uh, wild animal ethics isn't exclusively concerned with anthropogenic harms. So an anthropogenic harm is just a, a harm caused by human beings. And there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of ways that human beings harm wild animals, you know, most directly by hunting and fishing and things like that, but also slightly more indirectly by climate change and pollution. Obviously, these are big concerns for wild animal ethics, um, but they're not the sole or exclusive concern. Um, we're also concerned with what are called naturogenic harms. So a lot of, or perhaps most of the harms that wild animals endure have nothing to do with human beings. They're purely the result of natural processes that human beings haven't created or started, that human beings aren't involved with in any way. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, um, so th this is the part where I'm going to maybe describe a couple of things that might be slightly upsetting, so just brace yourself. Um, so there are a lot of causes of, of wild animal suffering. I don't have the time to go into them in a huge amount of detail, but I'd like to just briefly look at a few of them. Um, next slide, please. So first very common cause of suffering in nature is disease, um, which is 
very, very common. Uh, I mean, every species has diseases that particularly afflict it. Um, of course, you know, animals don't have medicine, they don't have doctors, they don't have anything like that. They just, when they get sick, they either suffer and get better or they suffer and die. Um, got a couple of examples here. The first one is uh, a rabbit suffering from myxom bleh, myxomatosis. This is a very common disease for European rabbits, especially. It causes swelling, skin lesions, hypothermia, difficulty breathing, and it's almost always fatal. Um, in fact, it's it's been it's been used by humans as a kind of biological warfare agent to uh, control populations of animals in in Australia. But it, it is a it's a natural disease that infects rabbits all over the world. Um, next slide, please. Um, another extremely common cause of suffering in nature is parasitism. Um, one biologist has described parasitism as the most popular lifestyle on earth. Um, there are a huge number of parasites that infect um, many different animals of almost every species. In fact, even many parasites have parasites that parasitize them. It's, it's extremely common um, for animals to have many parasites at any time. And this can cause pretty intense suffering. Um, we see a fox here that's suffering from mange. This is caused by a, a kind of a mite that burrows into its skin, causes kind of allergic reactions, um, causes extreme itching and pain, and eventually skin infections and so on. Picture on the left is, um, so this is a, you can see a caterpillar here with some kind of larvae uh, attached to it. So these larvae are called, uh, they're, of a species or a family of species called Ichneumonidae. So this is a species of parasitic wasp, um, which is like something out of a, a horrible sci-fi movie. Essentially, um, the, the life cycle of these wasps involves um, laying their eggs into living hosts, usually caterpillars. Um, the eggs then hatch while they're still inside the caterpillar and the larvae, as you see in this picture, eat their way out. Um, so it's it's pretty brutal. And this is not some rare thing that just happens, you know, on some some sort of nightmarish island somewhere. There's like 10,000 different species of Ichneumonidae wasps. So this is, this is another extremely common cause of suffering in nature. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another common one is extreme weather conditions. Of course, animals don't have the kind of shelters that human beings have. They don't have clothing, they don't have somewhere they can go when the weather gets really bad. So they suffer a great deal from extreme cold, extreme heat, droughts, and things like that. Um, next slide, please. They also suffer a lot from natural disasters. Uh, so we have a couple of pictures here. One is of a flood in a nature reserve in India about five years ago, uh, which killed quite a lot of animals. Um, on the right, then, we have pictures of the Australian bushfires from a couple of years ago. Um, and the numbers of animals killed in these fires are shocking. It was something upwards of one billion animals, so a thousand million. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, and I guess we're all pretty familiar with predation. Uh, of course, there are a lot of predators in nature who are who have to live by killing other animals. Um, I think sometimes we get a slightly sanitized. Um, version of what happens when predators kill their prey, you know, on television and so on. Usually what happens on the TV is you see a, a sort of a hunt, a quick chase, you see the predator tackle the prey animal and then the camera cuts away and the next scene is the predator happily eating the, the dead animal. Um, in reality, it, it can often be a lot more brutal uh, and a lot more protracted than, than what we're used to seeing on, on TV. So, a lion, for example, um, it can kill small animals very quickly. It can jump on them, snap their necks. But when it takes down a big animal like a zebra, it can't get through the neck. There's, there's so much muscle and, and flesh there that it can't get through the neck to break it. What happens is the lion will clamp its jaws around the neck and essentially suffocate the zebra over six or seven minutes or so, which... You can imagine having a lion attached to your neck for seven minutes while you're trouble, struggling to escape. It's um, not very pleasant. Also, a lot of animals such as hyenas and bears will 
not even kill their prey before they eat them. It's just part of the hunting strategy that they've evolved to have. They'll most typically eat the prey animal while they're still alive, typically going, typically starting with the soft underbelly, which is where we get that phrase from. Um, typically they'll disembowel their prey and eat them while they're still struggling to escape. Of course, it's not just predation that, that causes suffering like this. There's also conflict uh, within species. So the picture on the left here shows uh, an adult lion who's a male lion who's just taken over a particular pride. He's driven away the previous dominant male. And what they almost always do in this instance is kill off all of the um, children that the previous um, dominant lion has sired. So this is so that he can spread his own genes and have his own children and, and so on. And again, this is very, very widespread in nature. It's not just, you know, the vicious animals like lions. It's monkeys do this, baboons do this. It's extremely common. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so at this point, we, we've looked at a, a bunch of different causes of suffering. Um, and you might think at this point, well, okay, there are lots of causes of suffering in a wild animal's life, but maybe overall, the lives of wild animals are still pretty good. So we could we could take the zebra's life, for example, and we could acknowledge, okay, fine, she, she suffers from a lot of things. She's um, typically um, in danger of starvation, in danger of predation. Eventually she'll die probably from predation or starvation, but we might think the good things in her life still outweigh the bad things. So if that's the case, then maybe we might think, wild animal suffering isn't quite such a pressing issue as I've presented it to be. Um, so I, I think that would be a mistake for a couple of reasons. So first reason is, is pretty straightforward that, you know, even if it is the case that most wild animals live lives that are on balance, overall good, we still have strong reasons to try and reduce the suffering that they do actually experience. And, you know, this is pretty obvious in the case of human beings, but we sometimes forget in the case of animals. So human lives are generally pretty good, despite all the sources of suffering that human beings endure. But we still think it's really important to reduce the kinds of suffering and premature death that humans do have to endure. And the same principle should apply to animals. It shouldn't matter whether their lives are good overall. We still have reasons to reduce the suffering that they actually experience. Second reason this might be a mistake is that there is good reason to believe that actually most animal lives are overall bad, meaning they contain more bad things than good things. Um, and the reason to believe this is that most animals die very shortly after birth. Um, the reason for this is to do with reproductive strategies in nature. So some animals like human beings or chimpanzees, for example, will spread their genes by having a small number of children in whom they invest a lot of energy, a lot of parental care, they'll protect their kids, they'll uh, teach them how to navigate the world and so on. Most animals aren't like that. The vast, vast majority of animals are what are called or, or strategists. So this means that they will have a, a huge number of offspring. So it might be hundreds, it might be thousands, and in the case of some fish, it might be millions um, each time they, they reproduce. But they don't invest any parental care in in any of these children. They just they have as many of them as they can, and they kind of hope that some of them will survive. Um, so a good example of this might be sea turtles. So a sea turtle will have about a thousand, will lay about a thousand eggs each breeding season. Um, so if all of these eggs hatched and the little turtles survived and went on to reproduce themselves, of course the population of sea turtles would would explode but that's not what happens. What happens is the population of sea turtles remains pretty constant across generations. So what happens to the other 999 turtles? Well, you've seen those kind of pictures where they are hatching and running for the water and they get picked off by seagulls and crabs and wild dogs and things. The vast majority of them die before reaching maturity. Um, usually from starvation or predation, sometimes from dehydration. So if it is the case that the vast majority of animals die shortly after being born uh, and their deaths are pretty painful, we have good reason to believe that most animal lives are 
on balance quite bad. You know, they don't get to enjoy any good things in life or they don't get to enjoy many good things. They just get born, flounder around for a little while and get eaten or starve to death, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, next slide, please, Liz. Um, this obviously raises the question, what can we do to help or should we help? Um, so there's a couple of objections to the idea that we ought to help wild animals um, in nature. Um, the first one has been raised by Claire Palmer. So it's called the relational objection. So in short, she claims that although we have negative duties or negative obligations towards wild animals, you know, we shouldn't hunt them, we shouldn't fish, we shouldn't destroy their habitats and so on. Since we don't have any relationship with wild animals, um, we don't have any positive duties to help them. Um, so essentially she says that positive duties to assist only arise in the context of some kind of relationship, whether that be a kind of political or personal or familial. And these relationships are entirely lacking between us and wild animals, so we don't have any reason to help them. Um, so one problem with this objection is you know, if this principle applies in the case of animals, it should apply in the case of human beings too, if we're gonna be ethically consistent. And the fact is we, we absolutely don't believe that this is the case for human beings. We don't think that we need to have a relationship with someone in order to have an obligation to help them. So if any of you were walking along a river or something and you saw a stranger drowning and you could help them by throwing a life ring, you would absolutely have an obligation to do that, regardless of whether the person is a stranger to you, even if the person is, um, you know, from a distant country, you've never seen him before, you have an obligation to help him. So if you have an obligation to help strangers, in the human case, you ought to have one in the animal case, un unless some distinction can be made between animals and humans, that would mean that uh, this necessity of helping applies in one case and not the other. But so far, no such uh, principle has been identified. The second objection um, has been raised by some prominent animal ethicists like Tom Regan and uh, Sue Donaldson. So the idea here is essentially that, you know, animals are competent to manage their own affairs. You know, uh, animals don't need our help. Animals have evolved to survive and flourish in particular environments. And even if their lives look kind of brutal to us, you know, they're competent to handle whatever life throws at them. And for us to interfere with their lives is kind of paternalistic or it might even uh, be harmful to them in some way. Um, so I, I think we can accept maybe that mature animals uh, are competent to manage their, their lives most of the time. So a mature animal is generally capable of finding food for herself and avoiding predators and that kind of thing. But as we've seen uh, in, in a couple of slides ago, um, most animals in the world aren't mature animals. They never even get the chance to become mature animals. We, they, they get born in huge numbers and then they die very quickly. So even if it is the case that mature animals are competent to handle their own lives uh, and it might be wrong to interfere with them when they're, with their lives too much, that's not the case for immature animals, uh, which constitute the vast majority of animals on the planet. Secondly, yeah, it kind of, it is the case that mature animals are competent in some ways, but in other ways, they're completely incompetent to manage certain aspects of their lives. So when an animal gets uh, a disease, you know, there's no animal doctors out there, you know, curing, you know, curing diseases, right? There, there are some, there are some harms in animal life that they're completely incapable of handling for themselves. Um, and this is where human beings can, can and should step in to do something to to improve their situation. Um, next slide, please, Liz. Okay, so what ways can we help animals? Um, there are some ways in which we already do help them. Uh, sometimes it's kind of for conservationist reasons or it's for some other um, self-interested reasons of our own. Sometimes it's purely out of uh, beneficent concern for the well-being of wild animals. So we see here uh, an example of some animals being rescued. Um, the first is a, a beached whale. So this happens pretty commonly. It's something like 2,000 whales a year get stranded on beaches. Um, they would certainly die without human intervention, um, but it is possible and humans do in fact uh, make efforts to either prevent whales getting beached in the first place by, by altering the sort of landscape of the beach, 
or when when whales do get beached, we make efforts to free them so that they you know, so that they can survive. Um, also, in the case of natural disasters, we we try and help animals who have survived. So this picture shows um, someone giving water to a koala after a bushfire. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, running out of time. Okay. Um, there's also wildlife rehabilitation centers. So um, sometimes animals uh, become orphaned in the wild. Sometimes they become injured and uh, people will often um, help them out. Sometimes as in the case of this rhino, it's for conservationist reasons. Sometimes it's purely out of uh, kindness. So there's no reason to conserve pigeons. You know, there's plenty of pigeons, but we try and help them when they're injured anyway. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, another big one uh, is vaccination programs. So we do and we have successfully vaccinated animals against certain diseases. Um, the most important example of this is the case of rabies. So we've eliminated rabies from most of Europe and lots of North America by distributing these um, these baits which have the vaccination inside them. So this is kind of an, an oral vaccination. What happens is these baits are dropped in areas where wild animals um, are and they will be attracted to them, they'll eat them and they'll be vaccinated against the disease. Um, of course, we've only vaccinated wild animals against rabies for our own benefit because we don't want ourselves to get rabies. We don't want our pets to get rabies from contact with, with wild animals. But it shows that it is possible for us to uh, launch very successful vaccination programs. So this is something we could extend um, and we could do this out of beneficent concern for animals. So, for example, instead of killing badgers to prevent the spread of TB, uh, there have been pilot programs of uh, vaccinations. So we could vaccinate badgers against this disease instead of killing them. Um, next slide, please. OK, so there are some. We've seen some ways in which we do already help animals, and we've looked at some ways in which we might be able to extend the help that we offer to animals. There are still some really difficult remaining problems that we don't know how to solve yet. Um, so two key examples here are starvation and predation. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide, Liz. So as we saw uh, earlier, most animals reproduce in, in very high numbers, uh, and this causes the problem of starvation. They reproduce in numbers that are um, too much for the resources that their environment can provide for them. So a lot of animals end up starving. It's not entirely clear yet what we can do about this. Um, one option, which we do sometimes, at least in, in conservationist um, programs, is we supplement food for wild animals. So this might be good in the short term or if there's uh, an especially acute food shortage, but food shortages in nature aren't something that just happen occasionally. It's not like a human famine where, you know, things are generally okay and then, you know, one year in 10 we get a famine. Food shortages in nature are completely chronic. It's, it's just the nature of, it's the nature of living in the wild. It's the nature of the fact that animals reproduce in such huge numbers. So... Supplementation might be good in the short term, but it's not clear that it can help in the long term. So there have been some other proposals made and some research has been done um, on alternatives. Contraceptives for wild animals is, is one promising area. Um, so this has been investigated for animals like deer, squirrels, pigeons. And in fact, only a couple of days ago, uh, researchers in the UK announced that they had a, an effective um, contraceptive for gray squirrels, which is really good news because if we can stop them breeding instead of killing them, that's, uh, that's a vast improvement. Uh, one more speculative um, uh, proposal is that we could edit the genes of animals in some way so that they reproduce in lower numbers and perhaps also invest some greater degree of parental care in their offspring so that the offspring have a greater chance of surviving and few of them will, will starve. Obviously, this is a, a bit more advanced and, and complicated. It's going to require a lot of research. Um, there's also a potential for um, unintended side effects that might occur. So, you know, that's going to require a lot of research before this is something that we can roll out. But I think given the scale of, of the suffering involved in nature, um, it's certainly well worth uh, investing some money into that. Um, 
got a lot more to say, but I, I think I'm already out of time. So I, I think maybe I'll just leave it there and we can open it up to questions.